The legend of the artist Amrita Shergil is well known in India. Striking and passionate, she was born of mixed Hungarian and Sikh parentage and lived a brief but luminous existence against the backdrop of colonial India and emergent nationalism. Her devotion to painting and her allegiance to techniques that she honed in Paris produced startling imagery once she returned to India and rediscovered traditional art and everyday subjects that helped her to shape the course of modern Indian art. Shergill's self-portraits deconstruct the myth of the artist and force a reappraisal of her in light of the number of images that show the development of the artist as a sometimes hesitant but able technician of her modern female persona while at the same time defining modern painting in India through an emphasis, through an emphasis on individual style and subject matter. This is to say that the artist explores a range of artistic styles and projections of the self while casting herself as a modern woman and a modern artist. This stance as in self-portrait uh, uh, as a Tahitian, which we saw in Kathleen's pre presentation, breaks down at times in spite of the artist. Shergill's portraits, self-portraits uh, between 1930 and 1932 reveal a period of rapid stylistic exploration in Paris. She is seen as a young woman using all of her feminine arts as a fearless and confident teenager with, uh, with an easy smile and a blue sari, as a laughing bohemian with an armful of bracelets painted in the blue and gold broken tones of Van Gogh, uh, as a sophisticated bourgeois in chic Western dress and borrowing from the rich colors and romanticism of Delacroix. And finally, as an artist in a masculine blue smock and a collar painted in the style of Cezanne. The self-portraits during this early period in France were for the most part academic exercises, but they allowed the artist to experiment with shifts in mood, clothing and character and 19th century artistic styles. This permitted her to use the self-portraits as she did, as did many other artists before her as a personal exercise without the requirements to satisfy patron or friends. At stake was not only a serious and viable artistic career as a woman, but the development of a subjectivity defined through the self-portrait. As both muse and maker, Shergill consciously assumed the position of both artist and object. This split consciousness reflected her European and Indian parentage and upbringing, a duality that has led Geetha Kapoor and Partha Mitter first to equate her with the Mexican painter Frida Kahlo. Both artists were rediscovered during the early period of Western and Indian feminist awareness in the 1970s and early 1980s. One of Shergill's most striking self-portraits given to Amrita, Amrita's lover and fellow student uh, in Paris, Boris Teslitsky, and now in the collection of his wife, Eveline, is self-portrait with a red flower. The painting depicts Amrita with hat, sautoir, uh, a gypsy-like blouse, and a crimson rose with her face in close-up, establishing an intimacy with the viewer that lends itself to psychological inquiry. The immediacy and depth of the gaze contrasts with the flatness of perspective and creates an ambiguous relationship between viewer and subject that echoes Manet's sexualized women. The intimacy of the unflinching gaze and sullen pout is later seen in the vulnerability of Shergill's child wife from 1936. The abstract and Cubist-inspired background, the relationship between white and red and the hat as a halo possibly derived from Delacroix, created the effect of an icon or Amrita as Madonna. That the seemingly Christian allegorical reference marks a moment of departure in Shergill's painting and shares similarities with Kahlo's at time spiritually heterogeneous style. Frida Kahlo's leftist, leftist politics, however, her foray into folk art and later her complex relationship with surrealism were quite distinct from the post-impressionism to which Shergill remained for the most part faithful. 
Kahlo had a strong male affinities to Diego Rivera, Leon Trotsky, and Andre Breton in 1938, and a circle of intellectual and artistic radicals where Sher Shergill led a rather more isolated, if productive, and original life in India and later pre-war Hungary. This was a situation that by turns frustrated and stimulated Shergill as her diaries and letters attest. She increasingly relied on the belief that she was the first to truly interpret India for the rest of the modern art world. A few of Shergill's portraits recall various explorations of the mask for which at times she draws quite literally on the legacy of Western modernists. The African mask-like face so critical to these artists can be observed formally in self-portrait with the long hair, the first one, as well as the second one. The latter apparently uh, influenced possibly by Modigliani. The long hair in both portraits is a vehicle of open sexuality with the traditional Indian hair shown to be seductive, opaque, and a marker of the exotic, much like Freud's dark continent or the castrative potential signified by Medusa's hair. The contrast with Callow's later painting, Self-Portrait with Cropped Hair from 1940, which deliberately rejects these wiles through the guise of androgyny is instructive. Callow and Shergill both resist and enact the feminine in their career as artist. Joan Riviere's analysis of the writings of Freud led her to speculate on the position of femininity, something that we see as an ambivalent energy in Shergill's self-portraits from the early 1930s as they shift between feminine and masculine projections. Riviere marked in 19, remarked in 1929, Womanliness, therefore, could be assumed and worn as a mask, both to hide the possession of masculinity and to avert the reprisals expected if she was found to possess it. And she goes on famously to claim that they, womanliness, and the masquerade are the same thing. Like Shergill's long and flowing hair, femininity acts as a disguise, offering psychic and social protection for her more phallic energies. The, free, the changing of Amrita Shergill's face into a more feminine one is evident from her frequent allusions to the excess facial hair uh, that troubled the artist throughout her life. This was a feature that she was at pains to hide in her self-portraits, unlike Frida Kahlo, who, whose mustache is often distinctly visible. Shergill's lost nude, nude self-portrait with the palette that we see here, was painted during her time in Paris and it displays her both as object and subject, nude woman, artist, and phallic mother wielding a penetrative brush. And I don't think you can actually see it on this slide, but we have a kind of uh, what looks like a brush held at uh, an almost 45 degree angle. The palette and brush designate Shergill as artist rather than model in the painting. The gaze in the painting hits, hints at both desire and mastery in relation to the female nude and her own body. The artist's bisexuality further confuses the roles of woman as subject or object, which under certain circumstances could also be equated with narcissism. The latter condition, uh, also by scholars, has been characterized as modern. Shergill at times flaunted the possibility of same-sex relationships synonymous with pleasure and fashionable since the turn of the century and with figures like the French Colette. The androgyny of two of her Paris portraits, uh, self this self-portrait uh, on the left and on the right self-portrait with easel is evident in the artist's capes or smocks and her hair cut short or tied back. And I just want to point out uh, two possible um, references uh, for, for Shergill's uh, self-portrait with the nudes. Uh, and we see Ar Artemisia Gentileschi uh, clothed but certainly much more dynamic in the act of painting. Uh, as well as uh, Suzanne, Suzanne Valadon's self-portrait from 1931, where we see her sort of uh, nude from the waist up, but not crucially in the act of painting, which makes this painting of Shergill so special. This blending of gender identity is more pronounced in the portrait of Shergill's friend and possibly spurned lover, Marie-Louise Chastney. Childhood theatricals allowed for dressing up and archival photographs exist of Amrita's sister Indira garbed as a European Pyrrhian gentleman with Amrita dressed as her female partner. Her nephew Vivan Sundaram remarks that a photograph exists of Amrita riding a horse dressed in men's clothes 
wearing a tie, shirt, and solo topi as possibly breeches. The fact that Shergills did not have a son and that their artist daughter was their best hope for worldly success should also not be overlooked as a dynamic in her fearless lifestyle and her assumption of certain roles. Shergill, as a young girl in 1925, had a more normal adolescent preoccupation with the self and enjoyed experimenting with her looks in order to emulate the fashionable garçon. Uh, she wrote at the age of 15, after having grown my hair for more than a year till it reached below my shoulder, I have cut it. I look much nicer like this. It was at this time that Shergill began sketching herself in thick, crude outlines, searching for the weight and arrangement of her features. She embarked on a number of sketches in Shimla during 1927 to 1928. The visit to the hill station by her uncle, the Indologist Irvin Boktoy, was formative for Shergill and further nurtured her ambitions as an artist. But it was her teacher, Bevan Petman, who suggested Shergill study further in Paris. He spotted promise in her beginner sketches that showed her boldness of form and the black contour line. The latter, like that of Suzanne Valadon, would remain with her throughout her career. Shergill did not attempt to flatter herself in her early drawings. Their amateur nature testifies to the hours spent perfecting a technique and learning accuracy in the translation from eye to hand. It was in Paris that Shergill's self-portraits flourished, 19 and all. The artist discovered a community of artists and friends in which she could live and work. Photographs show the rapture on her face uh, of the artist dressed in a sari and seated in a cafe, engaging in the quintessential French art of discussing culture and politics, surrounded by male admirers and fellow students. The interwar years saw a number of artists from diverse countries and backgrounds haunting the streets, studios, cafes of Montparnasse and Montmartre. Many of them created memorable self-portraits, including Soutine Chagall, Pasquin, Fujita, Modigliani, Valadon, uh, and fellow Hungarian uh, uh, Voros. The cosmopolitan city attracted a number of competing artists who came to the then center of the art world to train and exchange ideas, hone their skills, and promote their talents in a culture where many were forced to forge successful careers or go home. Competition was intense, and Shergill, as a student, was thrilled to come out on top of any concours and dutifully noted every success to her parents. The, art, the, artistic, uh, the artist's uh, stylistic discoveries and personal awakenings deepened during the early 1930s, leading to a rapid succession of self-portraits that Shergill used as a vehicle through which to test roles. The self-portraits during this period broke with the domesticity as daughter-sister-friend the artist found at home, as seen in the many amateur photographs taken by her father, Umrao Singh Shergill. Rather, the artist instead explored her identity through a variety of independent or transgressive women in society. This can be seen in the dress of this gypsy-like in self-portrait with a red background, the chic cosmopolitan seen here, uh, uh, the bohemian uh, with the hand that she could not manage to finish, the femme fatale, and finally, artist seen in the, in the remaining self-portrait that we see here with the easel. Such portraits demonstrate Shergill evolving from girl to woman to artist as she explored a sensuality that ranged from the heavy-handed to the subtle. She cast herself in a serious light in self-portrait uh, with the easel moving deliberately from the domestic and intimate context of the 19th century woman artist to the monumental and majestic poses that recall those of Rembrandt and later Van Gogh. Uh, Shergill's uh, unfinished self-portrait also may have been influ uh, influenced by the pose of Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, uh, which she uh, could have seen at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence during her six-month stay there with her mother and sister in 1924. Even in the 18th century, Marie, Antoinette, Marie Antoinette's court painter, Vigée Lebrun, was accused of engineering her image and seducing the viewer in her self-portraits in order to garner attention as an artist. These self-portraits created a stir amongst the visitors to the salon who were moved by her, quote, exceptional charm and beauty on the canvas. In this respect, Shergill's self-presentation in cafes dressed in a sari drew attention and set her apart quite distinctly from other Europeans, male or female. This was also true of her self-portraits clothed in saris or bohemian wear, they distinctly marked her exoticism and allowed the artist to play the role of both primitive and modernist, as in the accomplished self-portrait as a Tahitian. 
Shergill's liminal status as European and Indian is merged in this portrait as the artist identifies herself as both modern artist and primitive woman with her nude torso and floral print drape posing in front of a Chinese screen. This work signals a, pi a pivotal shift for Shergill, I claim, and marks a transition in her self-portraits. On the artist's return to India in the winter of 1934, it is the other who bears the burden of the primitive, whether real peasant or represented one, while Shergill, crucially, remains remote, and her self-portraits begin to mirror her formal photographs of her as an unreachable talent or star. Okay, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, and you see here this, uh, this representation with her, her cousin Sumer, uh, that in fact self-portrait uh, uh, as a Tahitian is the last time we see Shergill represent herself as, uh, as nude, and we see that burden is then placed uh, on the other, whether the real or represented peasant. So I'm moving into the final section. The multiple images displayed in Shergill's self-portraits in Paris were substituted to some extent by the publicity photographs that her father and others, such as Dalip Singh and Karl Kandalavala, took of her on her return to India. Shergill recognized that the photographs were as essential to her career as her dress and artistic persona claiming. And it is for my firm plan to earn my own living, and for that I shall have to depend to a great extent on my own charms. As in India, the interest and understanding of art is at a low premium. I must arm myself on a war footing. The early photographs taken by her father, like Shergill's own self-portraits, present her as a modern girl, sharing traits with women from cities in Japan, Germany, South Africa, India, China, and elsewhere, who were easily recognizable during the 1920s and 30s by their iconic visual elements, including bobbed hair, painted lips, provocative clothing, elongated body, and open, easy smile. The so-called modern girl challenged the nation through her ambiguous mores, her self-absorption at the expense of maternal qualities, her adherence to fashion, and the right to choose her own sexual partners. Shergill was keen to portray herself uh, as just such a progressive woman and often spoke frankly of her sexuality in her letters to her parents. Shergill's status as a biracial woman with fair skin and her embrace, um, her embrace of European fashions and values broke with the image of the traditional Indian woman. This gave rise to a kind of emergent nationalism that could be observed more in her paintings of peasants than in her own self-presentation. As an artist, she sought the authentic, or what she called the essential India, as seen in her sensitive portraits of the rural poor yet her own image became ever more glamorized and remote. So early photographs show Shergill in the chic Western dress, the bobbed hair, the vamp, the makeup, the confident poses, uh, et cetera. Now, this is something that I, I've just seen recently and I, and I haven't actually explored the relationship between Shergill and the possible European influences, or in this case, Hungarian influences, to her stylization. I was focusing more on the Anglo-Indian and the Eurasian, uh, but this was something that I thought I could possibly develop uh, further. In any, uh, in any case, we, we come back to Shergill uh, and uh, her borrowing from the Eurasian or the Anglo-Indian uh, uh, heroines in silent films and early talkies in the 1920s and 1930s who were growing in popularity and gaining success with the masses. Women with mixed race backgrounds emerged as stars. Among them, Solochina, we see here on the left, Ruby Myers, who like Shergill had Jewish roots. And there are also a number of others. Such examples suggest the way in which Amrita and Indra Shergill with their cosmopolitan lifestyle and European fashions and heritage could slyly fit themselves into a model of modernity and popular culture, even if it potentially aligned them with women who came from the lower classes, but who had been able to transcend their background through talent and beauty. This is evident from the family photograph showing fashionably dressed girls with their flapper hairstyles and makeup. Shergill's romantic nature and love of popular film was further manifest in numerous references scattered throughout her letters along with published critiques of Indian cinema in Indian cinema journals. 
Films that she saw as a child in, in India were dutifully recorded in her early diaries and included many European and Hollywood silent film productions and notes of their stars. Amongst them, she mentions Countess Rina de Liguoro in Savitri, Pola Negri in Carmen, Betty Blythe in Queen of Sheba, and Barbara Lamar in The Eternal City. She even published her thoughts on art and film in magazines such as Picture Play in an article that included a prominent photograph of her. Shergill, as a modern artist, became analogous with her alluring, alluring photograph. In 1936, one Indian newspaper included her photograph, but no image of her painting, and labeled her the brilliant woman artist. Such a headline gave the artist the masculine aura of genius, with the article focusing on her individual style and potential, and potential more than the modernity of her art. The latter was not well comprehended by the Indian public, that is, what modern art was, which she knew instinctively. Shergill's striking image had to capture attention and often bore the weight of an encounter with a work of art that was not always understood. So moving to last page. Her publicity photographs borrow, borrowed from the era's sitara, the stars that we've just seen, as much as from the glamour and mystery of Indian royalty then and later uh, exemplified by the Maharani of Kuch Bihar and her daughter Gayatri Devi. Shergill had met the beautiful Maharani in January 1921 and on the SS Malva traveling from Marseille to Bombay. The Maharani recalled the moment when she first, she met the artist again in Delhi in 1939 along with her daughter, the Princess Aisha Gayatri Devi. Shergill glibly, if tellingly, also designated herself as an Indian princess, having been thus nicknamed in France for her looks and exoticism. Neither royalty nor the sitara were subject to societal rules, and class or glamour thus gave Shergill the requisite distance through which to explore authentic India. It was not until 1937 that Shergill finally portrayed herself in the manner of her stunning photographs in two self-portraits, self-portrait in blue sari and a self-portrait from the same year that shows her wearing ornate jewels. Her intention was to use these self-portraits as publicity for her career, and she wryly referred to one of them as her, quote, sugary self-portrait, reflecting perhaps the commercial intention behind it. The subjectivity of Shergill, so different from Tagore's own exploration of the unconscious, manifests in her self-portraits. A woman growing up in diverse countries and shifting political climates, forever informed by ambition. Her later paintings reflect India under colonialism and dominated by patriarchy, a time before female consciousness was raised in the 1970s and 80s when her face became one of its symbols. Her series of portraits in India give us a unique glimpse into a world in which the female image was to a certain degree conflated under, the na under nationalism with Mother India, even by Shergill herself, if you know that painting, and which substituted the real, if rarefied, image of a woman by a woman for the culturally imagined one. Yet Shergill's publicity photographs and the final self-portraits present a woman well aware of her own image. Tagore and the Bengal school's power and dominance were being challenged from within the country. Their male bastion, with the exception of modest Sunaini Devi and control of modernism, was both still rising on, and on the wane, which Shergill poised to strike. She remained in command of her image and of its possibilities, thereby altering the face of Indian modernism. Thank you. Thank you.